Um, there's also some very important liturgical sources which um, make uh, mention of exterior movement during the rite of consecration. I'm just listing them here. A mashtots from the early 9th century, um, and then two allegorical texts. Uh, there was a scholar, um, a litur liturgist, Father Daniel Findikian, who wrote a wonderful article on the rite of consecration. Um, and noted that there were these moments in the consecration rite in which the bishop exited the church and actually pronounced in whose name the church was dedicated. So if we think about how this would have worked, that there was this life outside the church and there was this sort of ceremonial dimension to the ex church exterior in Armenia, the, the sculpture, the program at Akhtamar becomes very interesting. Could I have the next slide? Um, we can go to the next one, actually. So here we have this amazing exterior sculpture at Akhtamar. This, again, I have to say, is very preliminary. I'm just sort of starting to make this hypothesis, this claim about the 7th century. But it's really interesting to think about how it worked in view of the 10th century evidence. So Akhtamar is always talked about. Really interesting sculpture, you know, fascinating Byzantine elements to it, Islamic elements to it, very unusual. But we always talk about it really as art historians, and we don't talk about it in terms of uh, really as liturgists, as, as uh, you know, sort of ex explorers of ceremonial. But if you think about the fact that in the Middle Ages, images were not just pretty pictures. They weren't just photographs and magazines and you turn the page. They were meant to be interacted with. They were meant to, you were meant to have a very instant connection with an image and it was it was a very special kind of relationship often involving veneration um, then we get something very different here and I would like to propose um, that we start thinking about how this sculptural program works in relation to exterior ceremonial and I think it's not hard to envision um, a congregation actually moving around this structure and, and talking about these images and having these images kind of work together with the viewer. In that light, can we just go to the next one? In that light, the model becomes even more interesting because we can think about this as part of a ritual. The fact, too, that it extends into our space, the model, unlike most of, of the program actually extends several inches into our space, makes this idea all the more compelling. So what I'm really asking is that we turn from dealing with simply the formal qualities, the, the visual qualities of this model, and start thinking about how this would have worked vis-a-vis uh, -vis the medieval viewer. So I think this is something that really should be explored. The models are fascinating as forms, but they also need to be understood. Um, in light of exterior ritual. Were they anointed, for example, during the rite of consecration? How were they, how were they used? And these are things that, that um, can be pursued further. So can we go to the next one? Okay. Um, I just want to bring up a really fascinating and precious description that we have of the model at Akhtamar that was written by a contemporary. Um, so it's always wonderful when you have a contemporary source that's telling you about this object. So here we have it. Um, and this is from the famous <coughs> chronicle, The History of the House of the Arts Runique. Um, and, and it includes a, a wonderful description of Akhtamar, this amazing church, but also specifically a discussion of Gagik and the model. Um, and so it says, in a true likeness, he uh, arranged opposite, meaning the, the sculptor, arranged opposite the savior, the glorious image of King Gagik, who with proud faith raises the church on his arms like a gold vessel full of mana, or a golden box filled with perfume. I mean, these are wonderfully evocative metaphors. They're very nice in a literary sense, but it's also interesting that they're specifically liturgical. They evoke specifically liturgical ideas. That golden box full of mana um, evokes the idea of an artophorion, which was a, a container or a pyx, a container for Eucharistic wafers, which was used in the liturgy. At the same time, I think very clearly, the golden box filled with perfume evokes the idea of a censer. So 
it's clear, even in the Middle Ages, that this chronicler was thinking about the models in, in terms of the cult, in terms of the liturgy. So this should help us with trying to sort of understand them. They were more than just um, simulacra of churches. So, the next please. Um, and I'm just showing you one example from the Byzantine world. This is a um, probably 12th century censor from Byzantium, now in the treasury of San Marco. Um, and uh, uh, an artophorium, which is, a, again, a container for Eucharistic wafers, um, in the shape of a building. So this, you know, this gives us some kind of a context for understanding our, our model at Ahkamar. Can I have the next please? Okay. Even more directly associated with the cults and with liturgy are um, stone reliquaries that are found in Armenia. Um, and can we go to the next? Um, Reliquaries exist in the Middle Ages in general. Um, they are simply containers for the mortal remains of saints. Um, and we see them, for example, in the early Byzantine period. There's a, a marble reliquary on the left um, in the shape of a sort of a building. Generally, you could say it's sort of architectonic in shape. Um, and then on the right, from the other end of the medieval world, uh, from France, from the 12th century, is another reliquary, a reliquary casket, so again in the shape of a building. So in terms of um, using this building form to house relics, that's not new. But what is new is um, the, the placement of these reliquaries and their, their stone material. Can we go to the... Um, so here you're looking at um, an interior view of a 10th century church, the church of Sanahim, um, in the northern part of Armenia. And here you have the plan of the church. And I'm just showing you this plan um, so that you can see the location of the model. It's right here. Okay? So you're looking, really, it's sitting on the lintel above the northeast chapel. And you can see, again, it takes the form basically of um, an Armenian church with the gabled roof and the cylindrical drum and... Um, um, and the conical roof at the very top. And you can see also that it has a large opening, so it would have been suitable for the insertion of relics. And it's most likely, if this is a reliquary, it's most likely that then it was um, fitted with precious metals, um, particularly on the doors, so that the relics would have been concealed and protected. Um, the next one, please. Uh, and here you have another reliquary, not too far away, the Monastery of Hachpat, which we looked at before. Um, and here, the reliquary is actually, again, in the main church, which you see right here. This is the main church of Sir Prashan. Um, and the reliquary is just here, in front of a large pier, basically, that would have supported the dome, or that supports the dome. Um, and it is, again, inserted into, um, into this, this support, and sits on a column. Again, it's a gabled roof. Um, it's obviously, it's, there's been some damage to the top, but um, we can see basically that it takes a, the form of a building and um, has a large opening, so most likely for relics. If we wanted to quibble, we could say, well, we don't know their reliquaries. They could have been um, used for other kinds of uh, means. They could have been artophoria, these containers for wafers, we're not sure. We're also not quite sure exactly when they date. I mean, they could have been fitted in later to the churches. We're not clear on that either. But they're very interesting because what they do is they show that this interest in making stone models goes much farther than simply the donor models we looked at, that other kinds of forms took this architectonic um, shape in Armenia. Um, 